Okay. Cool. Yeah, this means the presentation will be online, and um, I will create a blog post, which I haven't prepared yet, but I will do it like tomorrow or so, and so that you can do uh, or replay and um, reread whatever I, I talk about today, so that everyone is able to reproduce what I'm what I'm showing. So the talk is, or the talks are actually two talks. So first, I would like to talk about. Uh, thoughts about uh, container manifesto, so what you have to think about when you want to build and when you want to run a container, uh, which is derived from uh, Red, Hat's, Red Hat's 10 things you should avoid in containers. And I uh, extended it a bit and split it up into the build and runtime part. And uh, the second one is um, about collection of metrics, logs, and events with containers. And I created a little Go tool um, or framework, whatever you want to call it libraries um, that helps me uh, wrapping my head around it and helps me prototyping it. But I think this one might cause more questions and this one could also lead into weird demonstrations, failing demonstrations, hopefully not, but weird demonstrations. And uh, we can, you can derail the second one as you please. We can talk about containers or we can talk about anything else. Uh, but first, uh, I will switch to, where is it? No, the other one. No, the other one. Container manifest. This one. Okay, so I said, and I have a presenter somewhere here. Yeah, I said, this is derived from uh, a blog post from Red Hat that presents 10 things you should avoid in containers. This is, uh, and these are more than 10 things, so I extended a bit. And here we go. So uh, first I would like to give a little context um, about what happened last time a virtualization was introduced, or what happened last time when someone tried to, to um, virtualize and consolidate multiple machines on one. And um, who knows what the left hand presents? Memory, processor, output, input. A von Neumann machine, right. So this is like the concept of, uh, of computers. And um, in 1974, two guys presented a paper how to virtualize a von Neumann machine. And uh, the first thing they, or they looked at the three concepts like process, manager, processor, man uh, memory, and I.O. And they talked about um, what you have to do in order to do this. And the first thing they did, or the first thing that was done with virtualization uh, of uh, machines, was everything was emulated, right? So you could emulate whatever architecture you want to emulate on an x86 uh, processor. But what you have to do is um, you have to emulate instructions that are executed as many instructions on the host machine, right? So if you want to access something, then the emulator has to uh, to pass the instruction and then think about how to act on this instruction. And if it's the same, the same uh, instruction set, then it has just to present or just to prevent that you do malicious things. And if not, then it can just execute it. But it will still do many instructions for each instruction that is done by the, uh, the guest system. And this is, as you can imagine, not very performant. And um, I, from for my side, I, I work with uh, Mac for quite some time and. The first Mac I had was obviously a PowerPC, and when you wanted to run VirtualBox on a PowerPC running x86, that was like crazy slow. Okay, I had a MacBook Air, the first one, so that was crazy slow anyways, but it was slow. And when you execute the same instruction set, so you have an x86 and you want to uh, emulate an x86, you can do some shortcuts, right? You can use any ins insensitive instruction uh, and just pass it down to the CPU and run it in unprivileged mode and it can execute directly. But what the two guys came up with is that if you have like privileged instructions, that would be the P, and uh, you have sensitive instructions, sensitive instructions can be twice, can be either uh, depending on the state of the underlying machine or they can change the state of the underlying machine then you have to prevent malicious things from happening. So <clears throat> you have to uh, trap this sensitive instructions and then do some wrapping stuff around it so that nothing malicious is happening. And if you have it like this, if you have it like this, that all the sensitive instructions are privileged instructions, then you can just run any in unprivileged instruction 
um, as, uh, as a normal instruction and nothing will, will happen, right? But what in reality was true, that uh, the sensitive instructions are not only privileged instructions, but also unprivileged instructions. And in, in 1940 and 1994, that's a paper I, I found. I mean, today I'm not sure how many instructions are still there, but uh, you have 17, so you had 17 instructions that you have to keep track of. So you had to look at the instruction, then do things with it, and put it out. And what they came up with was the idea of either having a hybrid VM, and I think all these concepts you will recognize. I mean, replace a runtime uh, with a, from the virtual uh, machine manager. This is somehow what uh, Java runtime does, right? So you replace the instruction, the bytecode, uh, at runtime and um, make it so that it can execute. Or you can replace the uh, instructions before runtime, so you compile your, your guess or you compile your code so that it uses different instructions than the stru instructions that your, your uh, application wants to do. Or what you also could do is uh, adapting the guest OS. It's what Send does, right? Or what Send did back in the day, so that you the guest is aware that he is a stupid guest, so that he prevents the application from doing uh, sensitive ins uh, instructions um, and then hence make it faster. So this was like the first iteration on virtual machines that we that we gained. And what the hardware vendors did, uh, CPU vendors in uh, particular, they created. They can create either new instructions for virtualization, so that this is, uh, this is done by having different instructions, um, or create a new mode for instruction, uh, for virtualization. And this leads, uh, led to having AMDB or Intel VX, uh, VTX, or having uh, ARM virtualized attack extension, right? So in, uh, in an Intel or AMD CPU, if you have sensitive instructions, then the CPU will take care of this, all this manually with the hardware. Right? But this is the, the motivation, the instructions, so don't have to go too deep into it, but just um, as a motivation. For memory, it was kind of the same. The guest does not have control of the memory, so you, they had to introduce a virtual physical memory, and if you access uh, the memory of your process, then you will go through the guest virtual physical, so to speak, um, memory paths, uh, pages, and they will lead to the, the real physical memory of the host. They added uh, hardware support for this. Oh, too fast. They added hardware support for it. AMD called it rapid virtualization. It's called now, but it used to be called nested page tables. And in Intel, it's extended page tables. And if you do cut proc CPU info, this flex you will recognize uh, if you look at it closely. And for I.O., the same story, first emulated devices, then virtualization aware drivers, and later you have even virtually virtualization aware hardware. So for HPC systems, you have, you have uh, SRIOE, which provides multiple virtual interfaces for a physical interface, and then you can attach a virtual interface to a guest, and the hardware will take care of the multiplexing. Okay, so this was like a fast run through and uh, just to, to provide you the context of what happens back in the days. What happened back in the days was that they started very, they created a very brute force approach and then the, the ecosystem catched up and made it more efficient, right? So they made it more efficient uh, down the path, so to speak. And what happened now is that we have um, operating system virtualization with containers which uh, leverages kernel technologies, so namespaces to isolate processes, and the, the most uh, obvious one is the PID namespace, so if you create a container, and guys from my meetup have seen this kind of slide for forever now, but uh, when you start a container, then you, you tell the container which process you want to start the con uh, within the container, like maybe a PL, a cache, and then you have your own uh, view of the process table, within the container and you don't see the other processes of the rest of the system, right? And there are other namespaces like network, UTS, FC, and mount and user, uh, which are stored, started for each container individually. So each container has its own view of the Linux kernel resources that are presented to it. And what you can do with containers now is uh, having uh, sharing namespaces. So you could provide, you can start two containers sharing the same network namespace or mount namespace or whatever. And then they are able to communicate for the network namespace, for instance, they communicate.
communicate over local host directly and they have the same IP address, they have the same host name and so on. And this breaks with the paradigm of the virtual machine that everyone thinks of when someone heard about like virtualization, right? So before the sharing of namespaces, a container can be considered of a very fast as a very fast virtual machine, right? Because it looks to you as if you would have your own system, even though you don't, because the kernel takes care of all the isolation. And uh, C groups are, so this isolation thing is only for isolation, as I suggest. So if one container uh, gets all the, or tries to claim all the resources of the host, he's able to, you will just get all the resources and the other containers will start. To prevent this, you can use C groups, which is also a kernel technology to constrain resources for a particular group of processes. And by this you can tell the container to only write one megabyte per second on a block device, or 500 kilobytes per second on a network interface, or only uh, get so and so much CPU shares on a particular CPU, or even get only the first core and not the second core. So with C groups you can constrain the resource consumption. And also what you could do is uh, you can secure access to different syscalls, to different kernel capabilities by using SecCom, FMR, or SC Linux. And the preferred one I think it needs to be is SecCom because the other ones I always disabled when I was uh, acting with a, with a normal machine because they're painful to configure. And SecCom is kind of easy to configure because you tell in the second profile, you can specify which syscalls to make, and you can call it a group, and then you can have this group attached to a certain container. Okay, and there is a cool blog post from Jesse Fradell um, about the, con the, the, the uh, difference between containers, chains, and zones, because everywhere you go, they tell you, ah, oh, containers, nothing new. We have this in DSD jails, and we have this in Solaris zones forever now. But she claims, and rightly so, um, that the concepts are very much like a VM, right? So if you have ever used JS and zones, and I, I touched them briefly, but they, they look like or they feel like having a virtual machine. It's not about sharing namespaces. It's just about isolating the different um, guests, so to speak. And the same goes for LXC as well. It more feels like uh, hacking virtual machines, in my opinion. So you have to set up block devices, you have to set up networks, it's very cumbersome. But this uh, conception of, of a virtual machine kind of was the first class design concept for all of those. And she goes, or she has links to the BSD JS handbooks and the Solar Zones handbook. So that um, the concept was really having this isolation. And containers are just a term. It's, it's describing a combination of C groups and namespaces, according to her. And I think also seccom profiles you can add to this now. So the containers are C groups, namespaces, and seccom profiles. And if you grab through the kernel, you won't find any hint of the containers. It's, they, they, it's not, the kernel is not concerned with containers. He's, the kernel is concerned with C groups, namespaces, and seccom. So containers is just a term describing the combination of this. Um, of this of the three technologies and docker took this technology which was already in the kernel and started something new something yeah i wouldn't say cool but maybe it's cool is too too much to say but they started something that was taking existing technologies and try to make it easy to use and um, not caring so, so much about the security implementation in the early days, now they're caring about it obviously because they want to sell the enterprise edition, but uh, for the most part they are concerned about the developer and how they can run code fast and efficient and uh, package them and share code and make it very easy to use. And <coughs> this concept is very different from the concepts of BSD JS zones and virtual machines because this was more like having the isolation first and attaching or creating virtual machines so that it looks like that you can, you can run it as a, as a single machine. Okay, and uh, I would argue that a, uh, AMDB and ETX and all this jazz that was um, done for virtual machines hopefully will be done for containers as well. I mean, Docker and Linux containers are keeping momentum on and on and on. They're they accumulating momentum. And I think that applications, the kernel and the hardware maybe will optimize to fit this role uh, in the future. So, I mean, all, already the container, uh, the, the Linux kernel takes care about this kernel features 
and they introduce more and more um, namespaces. There is a C group namespace now. There is an ARDMA namespace that is uh, submitted for 418, so a couple of years even now. And I think they will make more and more effort to um, to fit this container container flow. For instance, the procfs in containers or in Linux is not containerized. It's not namespaced and not C group anymore. So if you have a if you start a container and you do top then you will see all cores of the system, no matter how many cores are attached uh, to your container, how much, how much resource constraints you have, because the proc file system is not, um, is not C group aware. So, and this introduces problems when you try to uh, pin Elasticsearch, for instance, on a certain CPU, because Elasticsearch will start up and look at the proc file system, how many threads it should spawn, and if you constrain it to one core and you have 24, then it will say, OK, I have 24 cores, so let's make a thread pool of 48 threads. And then it will realize, oh, damn it, I can only, I can only use the first one. So that's like pitiful. That's why they have the, the knob to turn where you can say, OK, make a thread pool that size, because you have to override this default. And as I said, they add namespaces and C groups support for, for shared resources. And I think this will go on and on so that containers are more isolated and more resource constraints can be added to containers. And yeah, this is an ongoing process. OK, so far, any questions? That was a not so, not so short uh, introduction. And now I would like to talk about the container manifesto. So because I, I think, um, and out of my own experience, when you first start with containers, you consider it to be a virtual machine. So you start multiple processes. You come up with some uh, supervisor, like supervisor D, where you can spawn different services within your container. And you do all kinds of weird things, which is totally fine. But later, you will realize that you should build and run a container with certain ideas in mind, and that you con should consider some, some ideas. And uh, I have a little overview. So um, there, I will follow. I, I have counted it, but maybe 15 or so statements to provide some guidance. And it's an iterative uh, thing. So if you, if you disagree, so hopefully you will speak up and discuss. So I know I'm not biting. So be free if you're free. I try to be not bound to any platform. So no matter if you use Docker or Rocket or whatever, or you use Swarm or Kubernetes, it shouldn't matter. It's more to provide a general idea of how you should deal with news containers. And the aim is to keep containers clean and limited in scope. and hopefully very evolvable. So if you create a container, you should not care about the orchestration mechanism you are using. Right? I mean, I think for single containers and for developing containers, Docker is somehow the default. I mean, I, I haven't seen any, anyone, anything else used on a, on a local machine. I mean, you can run your mini cube or your Kubernetes cluster. You can, you can run your, uh, your Mesos cluster. But Kubernetes even will schedule containers, right? Docker containers. So, yeah, I think the the, the local scope is more Docker, but well, how you orchestrate it, it's uh, up to you. And I think Kubernetes has a lead. Swarm hopefully keeps up a bit, but in the, <coughs> in, the, um, in comparison to Kubernetes, Swarm has some um, some some challenges to overcome. So Kubernetes maybe is the first choice for services. But that's beyond the point. Anyway, so two of our parts are following. The first one will be a build manifesto, and I'm not sure about the name, but I think maybe it fits. Um, so how do you, how, how, what do you, sh what, what you should consider when you build a container? And the second one will focus on what to focus on when you run a container. And oh, and this uh, three, the three colors here is like. The red one I consider to be very strict, so I think I would not go down from this uh, idea or also this uh, statement that I take. The second one is more desirable, so maybe to, to have a sneak peek, like building a small container is obviously a goal that you have to achieve. The smallest container would be zero bytes, but zero bytes but maybe is not necessarily a useful container, so this is just a desirable uh, goal. And the green one, I think there are two or one, uh, is an idea, so I'm not sure how to deal with it. And it's like, obviously the most I want to discuss, but the others are also up to discussion. <coughs> OK, the first one is uh, avoid big container images. 
Um, I think that's, that's obvious because um, when you run a container, and we will come to this point as well, that you should have a very limited scope and you should not run uh, a mail server and a database server and anything else. And you should not have uh, maybe even debug tools in it because this can be handled otherwise. And this we can talk about as well, but it's not on the list. But maybe I can, if I remember or you remind me, I will tell you how I think this should be debugged anyway. But the, the limit, uh, the, the file system should be very limited. So un not unnecessary things should not be in there. I mean, even Vim or Top or whatever. If the container should run only the process that uh, it's intended to run and nothing else. And the less files you have, the less stuff you need to be uh, carrying off. So the, the less stuff you need to secure and the less stuff you need to um, optimize your second profile for, for instance. So if you run an Nginx server, then you want to be able to start a TCP server, and, but you may don't want to write stuff to file system. So um, this you can, you can handle easier if you have a very small container image. That's, yeah, I should click here and here, because it's like, yeah. anyway, the, the um, the uh, animation is not, not correct. But um, what you also should do is leveraging layering. So if you start to develop or to create your own container, you start with this Docker file maybe. So we inherit from the Ubuntu image. Then we do up get update to get the latest package list. Then we install curl, and then we install OpenGRE. And then we uh, clean everything we, we messed up so far, and even remove the uh, act lists so that we only have the things that are necessary to, um, to run the container. But obviously, each of this step, or not obviously, maybe I don't know, but this step, this will be a, a file system layer afterwards, this will be a file system layer, this will be a file system layer, and this will be a file system layer. So here you add stuff, here you add stuff, here you add stuff, here you remove stuff, and here you remove even more stuff. And all these layers will be different sized container layers. And uh, when they are started, when the container is started, the, Overlaying file system will then say, okay, I have uh, this update, I fetch a file, like a package list, and with epic clean, I remove this package list, so you will have the package list in your layer, and then you will have a command that tells, okay, this package list was removed, so in the resulting layer, when you start a container, this will not be present, even though in the layers it's present. So what you should do as a first step is take all this that is grouped and make it like this, so that you do this in one shot, so you will only create one image layer, which uh, is cleaned and is removed from all the garbage that you added uh, while installing stuff. And I forgot to install curl again. Anyway, but this one will be uh, an image layer, and this image layer has a SHA hash, so like a git commit hash, right? So the, the content is hashed, and this hash of the content will be used to um, address it in the registry. So address the, the layer. And if I click here, then I get the arrow. And um, what you can do afterwards, you have another step that just <coughs> copies a jar into a directory. And then I have a, a third step that installs zip, 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 q, zip, q, and uh, removes everything um, yeah, after it's installed. And I mean, obviously, this looks quite similar. So you could do uh, zip, zip, q here as well. <laughs> But the cool thing is that when you do it like this, that no matter in which Docker file you do this operation, like okay, in a timely fashion, so it should be closed because the content should be the same, but no matter where you do this, it will be resulting in the same layer and is, they will share the same layer. So you don't have to download this layer twice if you have different images using OpenGRE. And when you have this longer uh, image and you do this as well, this libzium zero MQ installation, then this will result also in a layer that is pushed to the Docker registry, and you can reuse this layer in another image as well. So grouping this um, by, by logical groups or by logical installations makes a lot of sense, and not have one big upget install that installs 20 packages, because this will result in a layer that is not really maybe in common with other containers. So leveraging layering is, is quite nice. And you can start very messy, so you can start like this, and maybe um, start from here and hand type and, and play around with different uh, options and have the Docker file open. And once you're fine with the option or with the command, you 
you create, then you copy it over to the Docker file, create a new image, and start from there again. So that's a very iterative process. Yeah, uh, okay, and you should avoid single layer images, that's what I just said, right? If you install a lot of stuff in a single layer, then you have an image that is quite big, or the layer is quite big, and it's most likely not to be reused in other images. Okay, last question. Sure. Uh, if it's a, it's a bit confusing because just for me, uh, if I if I run Docker build then then I normally just get an image. So is layer image a different like I would say there are layers of images in for for each command in the Docker file. Yeah, for each. So in the but in my, my, actually my question is is layer images the the, the, the the term for for this? Yeah, this is yeah. We, this are called steps in the Docker file, and each step will result in an image. And I mean, I, let's let's have a look here. No, where am I? Ah. Okay, so I, I mistyped meetup, but maybe we can look over it. So if I inherit from Ubuntu latest and I do run echo one uh, root test and I do this a couple of times and I do this like this. Yeah. Uh, 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 oh. And I build this, so I have a little have it here. Docker build, minus t, test. Hmm? Yeah, and then I mistype it. Okay. So now it's downloading the image. And, and each of the steps is, uh, is resulting in an image. So to explain this, I mean, this step is this command that you have in the Docker file. What it does here is it spawns a container, like to, it does basically Docker run. Uh, which results in this container ID or container tag, and then executes this commands this command. And once this is done, it commits the resulting image, this the resulting uh, Docker layer or, or image layer that you have this read and write layer when you start image. It, it uh, commits this to this um, to this uh, layer, uh, this Docker image. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So each each of these are runnable images. So if I do dran, oh no, I don't have this shortcut here. Docker run minus T E and I do it like this and I cut this file, then I will only see one to four. If I do it with with this image, then I will do I will see seven. And if I do it with with test, which is the image name that I that I told him to build, it will be the same. So is there a Possibility to, to show all these layer images yep. because yep. normally if I do Docker uh, images, there is no. Uh, so you have all these layers here. Thank you. And this is th this is what's pushed to. I mean, let's call it this. No. This. And then we push it. And this will push all the image layers. So this is the first ones or the the, up, the lower ones are I think that that's like the Ubuntu stuff. So they should somehow say uh, already there here. So this is like from another image that I recently built. But this is all the Ubuntu stuff, and these are the images that we just created. And when you push it, oh no, let's go, let's go too far. Anyway, okay. So this is uh, this is that. So your question is answered. Yeah, perfectly. Thank you. Cool. So click, click, click. And now, something that, that's like close, but not. <laughs> no, it's close. So uh, there's a new command uh, squash, squashing, no squash, uh, in the Docker build process, which um, results in a single image layer that fits the, the difference or the diff between the inherited image, so in our case Ubuntu, and the one that you are creating. So if I do the same, maybe let's go back here. If I do the same with um, minus minus squash, and this I didn't check because I don't like squashing, I think, yet. 
then this will result in only one image layer, or two, actually, the Ubuntu one. I don't know. Sure. I know, yeah, sure. So this, the couple of them are the Ubuntu one, and the other one, the, the new one, is the one that we just created. So what it will do, it will just squash everything, all the layers we created, all these different steps we created, and squash it into one, which is kind of nice in some parts, because um, and I think I have this on the slides, maybe. Because if you do something like this, so you install MDM, and then you have a trust store file, and I'm not a Java guy, so correct me if I'm wrong, but you have this trust store which provides you access to your artifactory. You can put it in your Docker image, then you do Maven install, Maven clean install, and then you re remove everything that is just artifacts or just stuff that is not uh, necessary in the runtime image. For instance, this trust store, you don't want to put it in the image, right? Because then you can just get the image, extract the trust store, and then you have access to everything, so that's not good. So what you want to do is you remove the trust store, you remove the M2 file uh, directory, which has all the stuff cached, so I mean, Maven downloads all the internet. Um, and then you, you do some cleanup here. And when you squash the image, this step and this step will just evaporate each other or will just uh, neutralize each other. So the resulting image won't have the trust store and won't have any trace of the trust store. Because, uh, can I, I keep going to the thing again? What you also could do, you can run, well, but for this we don't have to squash it. You can run uh, inspect our history. That's a cool hack, by the way. And, and it will show you all the steps. So if you do like echo my super secret thing and pipe it into a file, then you will see this in the history of the image. So even if you push it to Docker Hub and then you have your secret stuff in there, you can tell this by, by using this. But when you use squash and you do the same, ah, then you still have the history. I would have thought that there's no history. But anyway, if the trust store file is removed, then you might see that this was added or it was used, but you won't see, I mean, yeah, this is not the trust store thing. But, and then you won't see the, the trust store file itself. So this is the only thing I can think of that where I like squashing, um, that you can like, uh, prevent stuff from leaking out that you might not want to leak out. So no trace of files which are only used temporarily, and it, but it contradicts somehow the avoid single layer image thing that I talked about earlier. Um, and I think I, I would like it to, or would like to use it when you know that the uh, image you're creating is the, the, lead, the last image you want to create. So it, it, it's not inherited by other images. I think that makes sense. But yeah, this, as I said, the idea, I'm not sure about it yet. Hopefully uh, we'll be more sure later. Um, second one is uh, strict, I think. Um, you should not run multiple versions of the same package or library, or you should not install it. Because um, when you start a container, I reckon that you use no special library path or no special uh, Python path. That you have only one version of a library, and then you can you have a deterministic outcome of the image. So that should be strict, I think, at least to me. I, I think I would like to keep to this. Um, second thing is, do not create images from running containers. I think that's not very used or not very known, but as I showed this step thing where you, where the build process will spawn a container and then you docker commit basically to create an image out of the spawn container and of the, of the command that was given to this container, that's what docker build does, but you should not. So you should not start a container, a Ubuntu container, then do apt-get update and apt-get install something and then copy files in and stuff and then commit it to an image because it's not reproducible. And I mean, you can do anything with this. Uh, when you have a Docker file and you push it to Docker Hub, then um, you should be a nice citizen and uh, make uh, an automated build so that you point it to a GitHub repository, which has a Docker whole file in it. Because if someone likes your image, then you can look into your code or your Docker file and then realize, OK, I would like to do this differently. But it's very nice uh, to, to look at other people's work. I mean, it's open source, right? And that's what I'm doing as well. If I want to create an Elasticsearch image with my uh, parent image, uh, I just 
inherit from my parent image and copy you what's on Docker Hub because I mean that's what they do. So I should not be smarter than other people that are creating Elasticsearch instances. So that's very nice to have this Docker file. So don't do this Docker commit and forget that I taught about it. Another thing is uh, do not use the latest tags in CID CD pipeline. So if you want to have a reproducible chain of images, then you should not use the latest tag because, or you should not at least use tags in general because uh, the tags are not uh, are not are not stable. So I'll show you this in an example again. So if I do, if I go here, yeah. and I, I push this uh, this image right. And, and if I inherit from Kneep test now with uh, the tag latest, because that's the default test tag, then if I push a new image, then I will inherit from the new image, and I don't have the same image that I thought my image should be based on. So what you really want to do is, you want to use this hash here, this digest, it's called repo digest, and if we uh, inspect the image somewhere, 20, um, this is the, the name you want to use because this is the name that represents the complete content and the complete metadata of your image. So if you inherit from this, you will only get this image and no other image. So that's what you should use. I mean, for testing purposes, obviously you can use, or not obviously, but you could, you're happy to use uh, the text. But if you are running with GoCD or, or um, the other build pipeline, uh, Jenkins, then uh, you can use you can use you should use repo digest because this is um, this is the one that really counts because it avoids depending on time obviously and locally I already said that but you can fetch the latest image and when you pull the image Ubuntu image for instance it will show you the repo digest as well so if I pull another Ubuntu image it will say okay I downloaded all these layers and this is the repo digest of the of the image. And this is a little bit confusing because there are so many SHA hashes nowadays. So you have the image ID, which is not the repo digest, obviously. But when you push or pull it to a repository, you have this repo digest. Okay, uh, yeah, this is something that's more like open source well behaving. Um, I think, and I try to do this myself, you should foster, you should foster Hello Worlds. Um, usage or exploration of your image by providing same defaults first and the compose file. So same defaults meaning that if you have like Elasticsearch, you should not count on the user of your image to figure out which environment variables you should put into the image. You should just provide all the environment variables in your Docker file that lead to a sane, um, sane runtime of the image. And you should not expect anything, I think. And uh, the easiest way to do this is providing a Docker Compose file next to your Docker file that provides a hello world to uh, everyone. And when started plainly, it should function and using very sane, very resource constrained, uh, simple defaults. Yeah. Questions afterwards? Or no, no, shoot. Um, so, uh, pause for me. For example, you just saying you have uh, passwords and other default or user defaults inside of this, this Docker container. That uh, some people are will need this in their Docker file. So is there's a security issue if they if everyone know okay this is a standard password or default password for this Docker container and I can try it. So, so yeah okay yeah that's right and I mean yeah, obviously that's right um, but I think and then it's only me. I mean, if you're using on it on your local laptop, then nobody cares, right? I mean, if you are using an image in production or even expose it to the outside, then you should make sure that you know what you're doing anyways. I mean, this uh, pulling a Docker image and run it, it's more like uh, the free world, the freeware world in the 90s, right? Where everyone's pulling images and then starting to oh, look here. But when you want to put it to some use and to to production or, or environments where you need security or where you need any type of security, then uh, you should look into what you're doing anyway. So, yeah. Would it be a good way just to say, oh, um, you forgot to uh, uh, give a password or a user or something you have better? Yeah, but my approach would be like, make it as stupid as possible 
and let them take care of the security. I mean, yeah, you could do this, like failing if it's not working, but I mean, imagine, and I'm guilty of it myself, then I download an image, I start it, and if it's not working, then I download the next image. So, I mean, if you don't want people to use your image, you could do this, but that's maybe too, too bold. But I think it should be like sane, stupid defaults, and then if you want to run it somewhere meaningful, then you should, no matter, look at the image anyways. And then you can look at the Docker file, and when it says like my password equals my password, then uh, yeah. yeah, I would rely on the engineer to realize that. Maybe you can also do just you can. I, I guess uh, I tried, but uh, you cannot. I guess you can also uh, only have one Docker Compose file, but you can have multiple Docker files, and so you can um, write Docker files for your local environment, a Docker file for uh, stage environment, and maybe no Docker file for you or just Docker file without, uh, you can put it in your local environment and in your stage environment. In your Docker file, you have password and so on, but in your live environment, you don't put it in and have to pass it by environment variables. So, when you Docker compose, it's just an entry point for, for example, for local. Uh, this would contradict this. Like, it should run the same image no matter where on your laptop, okay. on small scale, on distributed environment. I mean, sure, I mean, this could be done and uh, People argue that you should have one prop image and one dev image and one local image, but in my opinion, it should run everywhere because otherwise, what do you test? I mean, if you test the local one and you think, oh, it's fine, and then you push the prop one to production, who knows what? I mean, you could maybe you could have a Docker file that inherits from the, the prod one or the dev one and then just sets the same defaults to meaningful defaults. Maybe maybe that that is possible, but I would rather have one image to use it everywhere. Mm -hmm. But you might try very, and I'm, 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 I think that's desirable. I mean, I'm not saying that it's like strictful. So, but it should be easy to to use the same um, the same Docker service when you are. And we don't talk don't talk about it. Don't talk about Docker services yet, but. When you have your local Docker Swarm, you, you start your service with only one container, right? And it should be possible to just scale it up to five containers even on your laptop if it's not resource uh, full. And I can show this after. Um, and, and yeah, by, by doing this, everyone, even the developer, or not even the developer, the developer knows the constraints, right? If he scales his Elasticsearch cluster on his nodes to five, on his node to five, and it takes two processes, uh, processors, uh, then he is aware that this could be run in production and at scale, and so I think I think it's desirable to have only one image. But I mean, obviously, if you start, you can you can only develop a Docker file for local use, and if you want to try out something, I mean, you should not think about putting a Hadoop container out, which is like distributed because this is really painful, and maybe you want to run one container with a lot of processes even running it. But anyway, so this I think is desirable. I'm not saying that's strict. Um, yeah. Well, also, what, what I think for me at least works very good is having an entry point for pre run scripts. So this is a very ugly bash script, and I was told that this is a stupid way to do bash. So it should be like while, and then I should pipe in the find command. Again, uh, PRs are welcome. Um, so what I'm doing here is uh, I have an entry point, and you guys know what entry, the difference between entry point and command in Docker file? So if you please explain, a little bit. explain a little bit, okay, we'll do. So if you have a Docker file, you can tell him to when the Docker when the container is started without any options, you can tell him to what command to run, right? So this is a command. And if I do Docker build again, build, build, and I do Docker run, and I should have it somewhere. I, I do it like this, so there's the same command without any command. Wait. No, there is no.
Docker is broken. No, but we have now 10 steps, so. Here we go. Let's run command. Yes, run command. Ah, maybe I should use the correct image. That helps sometimes. So it will just execute the command that I'm, I told him to, to execute. And um, I can override this command flag in the Docker file by just doing this. So this will not do cut root test. It will execute a bash, right? And um, so if I do, uh, no. <coughs> if I do an entry point, I can uh, predefine commands that should be used, or part of the command. For instance, maybe I want to, and the, entry, the default entry point has been bash. So uh, when you execute this with, uh, without the entry point here, what it, what it actually does is it creates a container with bash and then cut root test. And if I do this, then, um, and I remove even this, then I override the entry point to be cut. And if I do docker run now, then I can just provide the, uh, the argument for, um, for the cut command and it will be replaced or it will be added to the cut command, right? And uh, So you can configure the command? Yeah, you can configure, yeah, you can somehow configure the command, yeah. And what my suggestion is to have like an entry point sh script, oh, I should copy it in, copy, copy, and put it here maybe, and then I provide the entry point this, and if my entry point dot sh looks like this, This, and I build it. So what would happen if I do this cut again? Any guesses? It brings the message and then executes the code. Exactly. So that was not too 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 hard, right? So and and, and this uh, this cut command could be the uh, this this entry point command could be the, the one that I showed here, and it's uh, in GitHub, it's called init plain, plain. So I have uh, entry point here, which is kind of what I just showed. And you can even provide uh, an environment variable entry user, and then it will, pro it will start the process as this environment, as this entry user. All right, so if I do this with, um, Talk around where is it? This one. If I use, for instance, my very famous plain init image, not so famous, but anyway, dash. This will execute a couple of entry points that I provided by in this directory here, and uh, and then execute the command bash. And if I, if I tell him to use the environment variable entry, entry user nobody, then we'll execute the command is nobody. Simple as that. And the cool thing about this, I mean, I don't want to praise myself, but the cool thing about this is, I actually want to, uh, is that no matter how many layers you have in between or how many images you have in between, you can just drop the file here and open the entry with, uh, with some number in front and then it will execute it on top of the other scripts that are already there. So you don't have to care about, oh, do I overwrite the entry script? You just provide a new entry script and hopefully it has not the same name as an already existing one. But if it doesn't, then you can just drop it in and, um, and uh, it will be executed. Okay, but this is an idea. I mean, it's, I don't know. I, mean, I think on it, that's I think that's desirable, but it's basically just an idea. And I think that's I think that's even now how many of the oh, guys do it. Not really. Uh, yeah. 
So uh, yeah, Docker ignore. So you all know Git ignore, I, I assume. Uh, with Docker ignore, if you create, if you do Docker build, what it will do, it will compress or it will uh, it will take everything that is next to your Docker file and send it to the Docker engine. So imagine you have a, a binary there that is not part of the Docker uh, Docker file. It will send it to the to the Docker engine. So that's like not desirable, right? You have a big one gigabyte file and you just want to run the Docker file that I just showed, so without any adding, then uh, you should have a Docker ignore file where you state which files should be uh, ignored when sending the stuff. Right? That's good practice. And also if you use uh, remote uh, Docker engines, then you might consider using compressed because this will compress the send uh, action of the Docker client to the Docker engine. So if you have limited bandwidth, and you want to send 50 megabytes, and you are like on the countryside of Germany, like I am, my mother is, then uh, you don't want to run or to, to send everything uncompressed because that's like just uh, wasting bandwidth. Then uh, I think the strict one is uh, keep container ephemeral, uh, meaning that the, the uh, file system within the container, so the root file system of the, uh, of the container, should be fairly small, as we said, and it should be stateless, and it should not be used, um, it should maybe just used um, <coughs> as, a, as a read file system, right? So, for instance, if you have a, a, an application that logs to var log, then um, this uh, directory is obviously written a lot too, right? And if you don't use volumes for this directory, then it will write it to the copy and write file system of your Docker engine, and then it has to Look okay. Uh, look through all the layers of the over over the overlay file system, and uh, it's very it's, it costs performance, and it also like pollutes the the uh, Docker read write layer that's on top of it. And maybe you want another demonstration for this as well, easily shown. So let's say I have this, no, not this. How's it called? Meetup. So let's say, let's say, let's say, let's say, yeah, oh, let's just run an image, this image even, even here, and uh, okay, I run this image, open another shell, make it bigger somehow. Working. Uh -huh. oh. Oh. Anyway, um, and um, so if you start a container, as I said before, you you take all the images, all the layers that we sh that I showed before, uh, as read only, and then you create a read write layer on top where you can do stuff, right? And um, and you can show this read write layer by doing Docker diff, and then. Um, and then you see, okay, well, I have created this uh, directory, and I created a file there, and then I, I created also a run secrets file there, right? Um, and if I add stuff to, let's say, root test again, or maybe I remove it, Then I now added this file and, uh, well, I changed the directory here, not created it. Uh, I created this file, I added this file to the read-write layer of my container, right? And this is a little bit cumbersome because uh, the, uh, the overlay file system has to take care, has to make, make sure that it knows what's, what's going on there and which files are removed and so on. So you should not use the container file system, the root file system for anything that's really important. What you want to do instead is you want to create a volume like this, for instance, and this will create a directory outside of the of the uh, of this read-write layer, which is not part of this copy and write union file system. And you can add stuff here without the union file system caring about it. So if I do this, then this will be not part of the of the files of the of the diff here, it says okay. It was 
this container, this directory was added, but this was just added because it was mounted in slash data here. Okay? And what you could also do, this then I'm then I'm shut up about this one. You could also use read only. And this will uh, and this will uh, just mount the complete file system of the container. This read write layer normally will, will mount it as a read only. So you cannot even change the file system, the root file system of the container anymore. But I'm way too, way too slow, right? So maybe I should buckle up a little bit. Anyway, so. So use volumes uh, for performance reasons and for stuff that's worth keeping. So you can bind mount the directory from the host, for instance, so that if you have a MySQL container and you kick the MySQL container and start a new one, you don't have to start from scratch, but you reuse the MySQL data from the previous one, right? And this gives you this uh, stateless container that's just that you can kick and you can restart. You can do rolling updates uh, on this container without losing the state. Right, so the current con con uh, the container should be stateless, and the state should be kept in volumes. Yeah, only run on now we are switched. We have already switched to the runtime manifesto. So um, second one is uh, only run one process or application per container. So um, as I said before, it avoids the burden of process supervision. So if you have uh, two processes that you want to start, let's say like a web server and a database. A web uh, daemon and a database daemon. You need to run like something like supervisor D or even system D within the container, and I think that's like way too much. Because uh, first, if you want to kill the container, you send sick kill or sick term or whatever, and then your your supervising uh, tool has to make sure that both processes are killed. Right? If you only run one process, then this process will get the signal and then will will be killed or will be terminated. So it avoids the burden of processing uh, of the supervision, and it's, I think, very important because with operating system virtualization, you don't want to start an operating system within the container. So only one process, if possible. I mean, you can start with the full-fledged virtual machine light, so I think it's called system container, but what you really should do is an application container which only has one um, scope. And what's also nice about this is that your metrics and logs are very clean. So if you only run Nginx and you only have Nginx logs, and you only have the system metrics of this daemon there. Yeah, this is actually from uh, from this uh, Red Hat thing uh, when I realized or remember I quite well. So don't do not, do not rely on IP addresses. So my containers are nutted behind uh, the bridge that you create when you start the Docker daemon, and you should not use fixed IPs. I mean, nowadays you should not use fixed IPs anyways, but especially for containers, um, you should not use it. Uh, as well. And instead, I would recommend to use the uh, light like service discovery that comes with the platform. For instance, uh, I think in Kubernetes it's the same, and for Docker Swarm it's also that you can uh, address other containers by the service name, you can address them by the container name and by the container uh, ID, even ID, I think. So you should leverage this to make it very, um, very transformable and very uh, movable. <coughs> to the platform. Yeah, in my opinion, and I think it's also common sense, uh, use environment variables or secrets for configuration. So like we talked before with the uh, uh, um, password, for instance, I would use uh, uh, environment variable for the stupid password and um, maybe a Docker secret for, for harder passwords. So Docker secrets, for those of you not familiar with Swarm, in Swarm you have uh, a raft cluster and this raft cluster populates a key value store that each of the swarm nodes can access. And you can, uh, you can create a secret, which is just data, like text, for instance, and you put it in a secret. And then the service can uh, use this secret, and this secret will be mounted as a file to the, fi to the file system of the container um, in the tenderfs uh, file system. So that uh, it's, it's part of the swarm cluster. So if you add a node, then the and another node starting a container can access the secret as well. And it's not accessible from the outside world. So not as easy as accessing a password uh, that's like an environment variable. Because like I show, uh, showed, you can access, uh, you can inspect containers, but you also can inspect services, and you also can inspect images. 
and the image what I show. And the inspection of the container will show all the environment variables used of the container. And if it contains the password, then maybe not the smartest thing to do. Yeah, and what it also does, like these environment variables and secrets, is that it avoids coupling of the to, people, to, to constraints or stuff you have to set up on your host. So you could also use files, like password files or environment <coughs> files on host. But if you start a service, then you have first to make sure that this file is present on the host that you want to start it on. So I think environment variables and secrets are much nicer. Yeah, this is obvious, do not run processes as root. So if you can uh, exploit a process and you are dropping uh, to a shell and you have root access, then you can uh, read all the files of the host, of the container, I mean, of the container. So with using uh, non-root processes like nobody, you can only access files and directories accessible to nobody, which should not be much. And that's about the fast run through of the container manifest. Questions so far? Was too, too fast, too much? But this, the other one is lighter. So what I will do is, and this I, I, can, I can show like this Docker Swarm stuff. So I have the Docker Swarm here, Docker Swarm, no Docker, no LS. Oh no, and I want to stop the recording and start the recording.